As our kids make their way back, I encourage you to pull out your GPS, your guide for prayer and study. I hope you received when you came in this morning. This is a tool we use each and every week to keep us engaged during the service and throughout the week. On the front, you're going to find information about today's message and a place to take notes. We believe each and every week we open God's Word and God speaks to us. And so we encourage you to write down one important thing that God is saying to you here today. On the back, you're going to find scripture readings that all relate back to today's message as we begin our new series about finding hope in the midst of fear. And you're going to find a way to pray for each and every one of those. We also post these on our Facebook page every morning at 6 a.m. It's a great way to stay connected. It's a really quick, short read each and every day to keep you plugged into the life of our church and to our life-giving scripture. Well, we are beginning a new series here today. Facing fear, finding hope in uncertain times is what we're going to be looking at for the next four weeks. We're trying to figure out, we live in a world that is full of chaos and stress and worry and fear, and it's an election year, so it's going to be even more hyped up than it normally is. And so we wanted to talk about how do we deal with that? How do we find hope? How do we have an anchor? How do we navigate through life when we're constantly bombarded by fear and stress and heartache? And so the scripture that's going to ground each and every week, our theme verse comes from 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 18 and 19. And as is our custom, we're going to read this together here each and every week to center ourselves as we begin. So will you join me as we read our theme verse? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. That's what we're trying to study for the next four weeks. How do we find that love in the face of fear? And so today we're going to talk about how it seems like we live in uncertain times. What do we do about that when we're constantly surrounded by worry? Next week we're going to talk about politics. It's an election year, so we can't avoid it. Don't worry, I'm not going to be promoting a campaign. I'm not going to be promoting a candidate. We're not going to get into the throes of the mud fight or any of that. But we're surrounded by it. You can't escape it. And we are so divided, we're so polarized to the point that even thinking about agreeing with someone who belongs to a different political party than you, that in and of itself is almost seen as a betrayal. How are we to find community? How are we to move forward when the very act of working with people we might disagree with is seen as unacceptable? So we're going to talk about that next week. How do we live in a world that's so politically divided in an election year, and how does our faith help us? in the midst of all that. That's next week. And on the third week, we're going to talk about failure, this looming cloud that seems to follow us around. What if my life doesn't turn out the way I thought it was? What if I lose my job? What if I let my kids down? What if I don't live into those expectations? What if I fail as a parent, as an employee, as a boss, as a sibling, as a child? What if I'm a failure? We all struggle with this, so we're going to talk about it. And we're going to close out our last week by talking about three very prevalent fears. The first one is a fun acronym called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. It's everywhere, especially when you can see on social media exactly what you're missing out on. Finances and our future. These are some of the biggest fears and stresses that we all struggle with. How are we going to pay for things? What is our future going to look like? What am I living my life for? And what if I miss out? What if my life, what if I miss out on everything that I thought my life was going to be? So that's what we're going to do for the next four weeks is look at these stresses, these heartaches, these conflicts that we live in every day and see how we find hope in the midst of all that fear. Here today we're going to be studying Psalm 46. This is a beautiful psalm that tells us where God is found in the midst of that betrayal and heartache. And so Bud's going to come read read that for us here today, this amazing psalm about God's refuge and hope. Today's scripture is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the hope most high. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease in the end of the earth. 
He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, bud. Let's give it up for Bud. He's one of our new MCs here today. Did a perfect job. Just an amazing job. Thank you so much, Bud, for helping lead us. Friends, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for a chance to talk about hope in the midst of a world that seems to be overwhelmed with chaos at times. Lord, we are inundated with breaking news, with bad news, with fake news, with things that worry us, all these things we don't know how to navigate. And it can be easily overwhelming just in our own lives. So God, help us to better understand these uncertain times we seem to find ourselves in and to see how you are truly our refuge and our strength, how we can seek that hope to feel that peace and presence so that no matter what comes our way, we will be okay because you'll be with us. God, open your word in a new and fresh way to us today and help us to understand what you'd have us here. This is your time, God, and we trust you with it. Do what you will. In your name we pray. Amen. So we have a one-year-old son, Henry, and he's homesick today. And I am learning throughout my year of being a new parent what that really means, because I'm told that at different stages, sicknesses are more or less dangerous, and the treatments are different. And it's like as soon as you figure out what you're supposed to do when this happens, no, no, that's for six months olds. Right now they're a toddler and it's different. And I'm like, you can't just keep moving the goalposts, right? Like it's human health. It should be the same. So I'm trying to figure out what this looks like. And he's been sick for a few days. And every day Emma and I will say, maybe tomorrow he'll be better. And he's worse. And well, maybe tomorrow he'll be better. It's worse. And then yesterday came and he seemed really hot. His face was really red. And so I was like, well, let's take his temperature and see if he's got a fever. And we have one of those fancy, like, where you just, like, rub it across the forehead of the baby and some voodoo dark magic tells you what his temperature is. And so he pulled it across his forehead, and it said 103.5. Now, you got to know, I don't know anything about what is good and bad. I just know over 98.6 is bad. And so I see 103.5, and I panic. My whole body tenses up, my palms get sweaty, and I turn to Emmett, and I go, it's 103.5, his brain is boiling, he's going to die, we got to go to the hospital now. She went, what? And I said, he's dying. And she said, from what? I said, I don't know. His brain, his insides are just cooking. And she said, what do you mean he's cooking? And I said, his temperature, it's 103. So? It's just a fever. That's not dangerous? No, nah, you don't really worry until it's over 104. It's okay. I said, what, you're just supposed to know that? Is it like a rule or something? She's like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you read about it. I don't know. You're, you're prepared as a parent. And I'm like, don't say that. You're prepared as a parent like I'm not. All right? But let's pretend I'm not. So tell me what, tell me what that means. So he talked about it. And he was okay. Needless to say, he's just fine. But that wasn't enough for me, right? So I'm calling all the doctors we know. We have three really close friends who all became doctors, and two of them are pediatricians. And I said, Emma, I love you. I don't trust you. Medical professional, tell me that this is, you know, okay. And my friends, like, text me, like, does he have a rash? What does it look like? Send me a picture, which is just stressing me out even more. And I'm like, oh, God, he's going to die. He's got, like, malaria or something. He was okay. He's fine. Today he's back to, you know, taunting the dog and throwing things. He's just sick. But it's amazing how fast that fear grips you. It changes your body, your muscles tense up. It overwhelms you so fast. On Friday, we had really bad storms. I'm sure many of you got a lot of the rain. We had some hail, but no damage. And in the midst of it, I love storms, and I was kind of watching around and seeing it and watching the radar, and then we were turning a movie on for Henry and getting ready to cook dinner, and then I heard a sound that was all too familiar. It was the tornado siren. Now, tornado siren goes off all the time, right? We think it's going to be bad. You know, you have to kind of look at the radar and see how bad really is it. So I walked outside, and I began to look, and I, and I had this weird emotion, this weird dichotomy inside of me. Because I grew up, one of my favorite movies of all time was Twister. And I wanted to be a storm chaser since I was a little kid. So when I was in college, if the tornado sirens went off, I'm like, load up the truck, guys, let's go. We're going to find this thing. You know, and following around my little, like, you know, 
little camera that had, it was back in the day, a little camera, a little video camera. We're going to get the footage. We're going to catch the tornado. And then we got married, and I was like, ah, oh, Emma probably doesn't want to do this. So don't know that I can go on these trips anymore. And then we had the dog at home, and I was like, okay, we got to watch out for him. But now we have a baby. And so I'm like going into lockdown, into the world mode. I'm like, Emma, all right, the tornado comes. We got to go into the middle bathroom, into the tub. Grab, you grab the baby. And she's like, I know what to do when a tornado comes. And I'm like, don't say that so calm. I know you know. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying it. You know, it's cool. I'm not afraid. And then I went back outside and I stood on the porch watching the horizon, right? Like I can stop the tornado, right? I'm like, come at me, bro. I got this tornado. But all of a sudden, I had this fear. What if that tornado comes? We have a baby now. I'm not invincible anymore. What am I supposed to do? How am I going to protect this child? And that fear gripped me, something that used to never scare me. I used to be excited about it. Yes, tornado! Now all of a sudden, it's terrifying. The series is about finding hope in the midst of fear. And we have fear all the time. And it really is profound how fast fear can overwhelm you. And it's weird how this changes. The more and more you have to protect, the more you feel you have to lose, the easier it is to be scared. So many more things out of your control. And it feels like we live in such uncertain times. There's so much change and turmoil around us. It seems so hectic. And people say that all the time. We live in uncertain times. And I think we live in uncertain times because we're human beings trying to do life together. I don't think there's any such thing as certain times. Things change. Humans are fickle. Things change all the time. I think it's always uncertain. But I think there's one main reason why they feel so uncertain. And it's because we are reactionary as human beings. And our society is very reactionary, especially with social media now. Because now you can tell the whole world, and everybody panics about anything. We're so reactionary. And so I began to wonder, what are the things that scare us? As I was doing research for this series, I said, what are the things that we worry about as a culture in the United States? And so I came across this research done by Chapman University, and every year they do this study, this big survey of what are the main top 10 fears confronting Americans. And so we've got some of the slides here. I think this first one is from 2015. Yeah, there we go. So if you can't read this, it's okay. I'm going to read it out to you. But these are the top 10 fears for which the highest percentage of Americans reported being afraid or very afraid of. This is from 2015. Number one, corruption of government officials. 58% of Americans said they were afraid or very afraid that there is corruption in our government officials. Going down the line, you have cyber terrorism, corporate tracking of personal information, terrorist attacks, government tracking of personal information, bio-warfare, identity theft, economic collapse, running out of money for the future, and credit card fraud. Most of us recognize these. We know these fears. We see them in the news. We hear about it. Some of us are deeply concerned about some and maybe not so much about others. But these are the top 10 fears in 2015. And I want to show you how these progressed over time. So our next slide shows 2016. Same research institute, same question. And these are the results for one year later. The top answer stayed the same. It went up 2%, though. 60, almost 61% of people fear the corruption of our government officials. Terrorist attacks has jumped up two, and inadequate funds for the future has jumped up six. But the next three are all brand new. Being a personal victim of terrorism, not just worried it'll happen to our country, but personally afraid it will happen to me, was a new fear. Gun control, which probably means the fear of gun control laws being passed or of no gun control laws being passed, right? There's fear on both sides of the aisle. Loved ones dying, that was a new one. Economic collapse and identity theft just switched places. But the loved ones who are seriously ill was a new one, and the Affordable, Her Affordable Health Care Act. So a policy-based fear, not just health care in general, but this policy. Remember, 2016 was an election year, a presidential election year. So that probably has the same fear on both sides. Some fearing that Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, wouldn't be repealed and we'd be stuck with it again. And those on the other side of the aisle fearing that it would be repealed and they would lose their health care, right? Because we're very polarized about this particular policy. But if you look at this, the top 10 fears of 2016, what is this? One, two, three, four, five of them are new. Half of them. From one year to the next, half of the fears that we worry about as a nation are totally new. We didn't even make the top 10 the year before. But it was an election year, right? 
And a lot of times what happens in the election drives our national conversation. So we would assume the next year, 2017, things will level off again. They'll get back to normal because we're not in an election year. Well, let's look. This last one is 2017. The number one fear does not change. In fact, it increases this time by 14%. Even after an election year, now 74% of Americans are afraid that there is corruption in our government officials. This isn't partisan on either side, just generically. Politicians, we're afraid they're corrupt. The next three are brand new. The American Health Care Act, pollution of oceans and rivers, and pollution of drinking water. Those are all brand new. Not having enough money for the future is the only other one that remained on all three of these lists. High medical bills, the U.S. involved in another world war, global climate change, North Korea using weapons, and air pollution, all new to the list. None of those even cracked the top ten either of the last two years. So in one year, in one year's time, eight of the top ten fears that our country wrestles with were totally new. I tell you all this not to scare you, but to say we're scared of a lot of things, and it changes from year to year. We are reactionary. You'll notice the pollution of drinking water is on here. We all know where that came from because of the crisis that happened in Flint, Michigan. Does that mean we shouldn't look into and we shouldn't be afraid that maybe our water is contaminated? Of course not. But it was not a national fear before. Two years ago, if you had asked, are you afraid that your drinking water is contaminated? Most people in this room would go, what? Of course not. I mean, I don't love Mustang, but of course not. Okay, we got some Savannah residents who can laugh. All right, all right. These fears are driven by what happens, and we react. And that's why I think times can feel so uncertain. So uncertain is that we're so reactionary. The top ten fears in our country change from year to year. Everything seems to be a danger. It feels like we live in more and more uncertain times. Now, when we talk about fear in this series, I want to make sure I'm not really talking about phobias like spiders and the dark and public speaking. I'm talking about concerns, worries, these big anxieties that we have, these stresses, these major issues that concern us. We worry all the time, and all these are rooted in fear because fear is a great motivator. It's one of the best motivators. And you see this all the time. Here's how it works. If you don't do or buy this, this bad thing will happen. This is how advertisers work almost all the time. If you don't buy this product, you're going to be alone. You're going to be sick. You'll die. You know, nobody likes loneliness. So buy this shirt. Then you'll look like you know, David Beckham. No, you won't. But that's the fear. It's rooted in that. If you don't get this thing you need, your life won't be as fulfilled. It won't be as great. That's the fear. We're afraid. Man, I don't want that. I don't want to look like that. I don't want to be left behind. I need that. And fear motivates us. Politicians do this more than almost anybody else, right? And we're going to see this in spades come this fall in our election year. If you vote for my candidate, life will be amazing. That's how they always start, right? Those ads are about to start playing. If you vote for this candidate, everything will be amazing. But then like September and October roll around and the ads get a little darker. Did you know my opponent was once accused of eating children? That's what it sounds like sometimes. They're terrifying. If you vote for this person, your life will be ruined. And it's terrifying. They paint a picture of our worst fear, and then they link it to whoever their opponent is. This thing you're afraid of, that's what they stand for. Do you hate America? Well, this person does. Well, then I hate them. That's what we say. It's fear. We're afraid of whatever that picture is painted, and politicians use this masterfully. Even religion does this. Even religion has been doing this for thousands of years. If you don't act this way, if you don't do this, if you don't believe in this, you'll go to hell. You'll be judged. God will be disappointed in you. If you don't do this, this bad thing will happen. And even the church uses fear to scare us into acting right, tries to scare us into heaven. John Lennon is famous for saying there are two basic motivating forces in life, fear and love. You're either running away from something in fear or you're chasing something you love. Those are the two motivations mostly for why we do things. He says when we're afraid, we pull back from life. We protect what we have. We look for safety. We pull back. 
When we're in love, we open up to all that life has to offer with passion and excitement. And all hope for a better world rests in the fearlessness of that open-heartedness, chasing the things we love. What motivates us, fear or love? Why do we have courage? It's not the absence of fear. Courageous people, it's not like they're just not afraid. Most of the time, great acts of courage are in defense of something we love. You see someone on the news because they threw their loved one out in front of a speeding bus and they gave their life up, and you say, how much courage does it take to do that, to step in front of someone and take the bullet for them? But you're protecting something you love. That's what motivates that. Of course they were afraid. But love was the motivator that they were chasing. Are we running from something or chasing something? When we look at Jesus, we see that he never uses fear to motivate people. Jesus always extends love first. He meets someone and he heals them first. He loves them. He feeds them. He prays for them. He always extends love. And then the invitation comes. Follow me. He never goes up to someone and says, I see you're blind. If you follow me and give me, you know, so much money per week, maybe I'll heal you. He never does that. He never tries to scare people into following him. He always offers love first and says, that's what I'm about. If you're about that, come follow me. And it's amazing how motivating that is. But unfortunately, religion often does the reverse. They scare us into the consequences of acting bad. And so fear becomes the basis of our faith. That's not the way Christ ever set it up. I think one of the struggles is a lot of times we see God as this scary authority figure. Someone coming to judge us and punish us if we don't act right. So imagine in a hypothetical situation that you're a drug addict. You've committed this crime, you're addicted to drugs, and you're afraid. And the way we see God is the God is the feds, it's the DEA, it's the police coming to bust us. And they kick down the door and they say, if you don't get your act together, if you don't straighten up, you're going to be arrested and go to jail. And that's how a lot of us see God. If you don't get your life together, if you don't shape up, Bad things are going to happen. You're going to fail judgment. And you're going to go to hell. And we see God as this scary authority figure that we run from. But think about what helps somebody who's suffering from addiction and lost in pain. It's when their friend shows up, pulls them out of the gutter. I'll be with you. Checks them into rehab. We call that the church. And walks with them through that. Loves them. I'm here for you. You're not alone. That's what Christ does. So many of us see God as this scary authority figure. It's like we've broken the law and we're hiding and we hear footsteps coming and we're all terrified that it's going to be the cops. It's going to be our parents. It's going to be somebody to catch us and we're going to get in trouble. And that's how a lot of us see God. And in that moment when we fear because the footsteps are getting closer and closer and then we see it's our friend Jimmy. And immediately the stress drains from our body and we go, oh, Jimmy, thank God. I thought you were the cops. You got to help me, man. I'm in trouble. And instantly, we have hope because someone's there to help. And they walk with us. There's a way out. That's how Christ is supposed to be in our life. When we feel the worst, when we've done the worst, when we feel shame and guilt and embarrassment because we've just done something horrible, how does God make you feel in that moment? When you think about God, when somebody talks about God, when you see your Bible, how does God make you feel? Do you feel shame and embarrassment and guilt? Or do you feel that friend that shows up that says, I'm here to help, man. What can I do? A lot of us have a wrong view of God. And so we fold God into this culture of fear. Something else that's judging us. Someone else we failed. Someone else who's going to punish us. Something else to run away from. To the point that people won't even go to church because they feel too bad. They say, man, I can't go to church. That's for good people. If they know what I've done, they'll kick me right out. Well, it's like somebody looking at a hospital going, man, if they find out how sick I am, they'll kick me out. Well, that's ridiculous. The whole point, the hospital exists. The more sick you are, the faster you should run there. It's the same with the church, but we don't often think that way. We think I've got to be good. The church is for good people. I can't go there. I'm too messed up, too broken. I swear. Mm. Nobody else there does. It's just me? Okay, good. (laughs) A little, little comfort in the crowd here. All right. God isn't this authority figure that we're supposed to be scared of. God is authoritative, and God does have justice, and that's all a part of this. But God is that loving friend that shows up to pull us out of the gutter to help us. And I know that's true because of this psalm. 
It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Our theme verse says, there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear because fear expects punishment. And a lot of us see God as the one coming to punish us. But this scripture says, God is our refuge and strength. So we will not fear no matter what happens. The earth will change, the mountains will shake, the waters will roam, will roar. God will be with us, a refuge and strength. The psalm ends by saying these famous words I'm sure you're familiar with. They say, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. These are beautiful words, poetic, heartwarming. But I have to wonder, what does that mean? What does it mean to be still and know that I am God? I mean, how do I do that? I just literally stand still? What, what does that mean? And I think for some of us, it means getting to know God, really getting to know God. So coming on Sunday morning and seeing songs together and listening to me preach is a great way to start, but that's not enough if you really want to get to know God. And I can show you, I can show you why. I want you to picture in your mind someone who's very close to you, your spouse, a close friend, someone who really knows you, someone who really knows you. I bet... If you think about how you got to know them, I bet you spent more than one hour a week with them. I bet you did. I bet you spent hours with them, just talking, sharing stories, getting to know one another, opening up and sharing things you don't just tell anyone, being vulnerable, being honest. That's how relationships are formed. The same is true for God. A lot of times we think, I can't go to church, I'm too bad. Or I think, if I just show up for an hour, (sighs) great, check can't build a relationship one hour a week at a time. It takes more. It takes more. What's motivating us, fear or love? Because fear's all around us. If you don't believe me, sign up for the breaking news alerts for one of the news outlets on your phone, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So I wanted to get an unbiased view of fact, which doesn't exist in our world, Um, but I said, maybe I can try. I'll subscribe to different news agencies, a couple on the left and a couple on the right, And maybe through all the craziness, I'll be able to see really what's going on. And let me tell you, it is a wild experience. Um, I get like 38 news updates a day. um, And they are all talking about the same thing, but it doesn't seem like they're talking about the same thing. Um, Here today already, it's 11.45 in the morning, and I have received six breaking news alerts so far today. Breaking news alerts, which I think that term should be redefined. All six were different, too, from four different news agencies. But so often we see that, and sometimes I wonder, what is the point of this? One of them I got a few weeks ago, it was about um, this couple was in a car crash in California. They had run off the side of the road, and they were both in critical condition. But that was it. I mean, it wasn't anyone of note. They hadn't passed away. They were just in the hospital. And I thought, how is this national breaking news? Is it tragic? Of course. But a car crash happens like every three seconds in our country. Why is this one national breaking news? What is the point of that? Is it to scare me? That's what it does. It reminds me that the roads are dangerous. It freaks me out. Fear's everywhere. We get it on our phone. Every time our phone buzzes, all of us go, oh man, what happened now? Fear is all around. I heard a funny quote the other day, and Chris told me, who said it? Zig Ziglar. Thank you so much. He said, I read the paper every day, and I read the Bible every day. So that way I know what both sides are up to. I love that. That way I know what both sides are up to. A more famous quote comes from Karl Barth, and he said, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret your newspaper with your Bible. And I love that. Read both. God calls us to be in the world, to engage with the world around us, to let our faith inform how we live, to teach us how to live in this world, but to not ever forget Paul's words, to not be conformed to this world, to not get lost in the fear and overwhelmed with all the craziness, to have a foundation and an anchor, to have our Bible in the other hand. Most of us read the news every day, or at least we read Facebook every day, which is where a lot of people get their news. But I wonder how many of us have the Bible in the other hand. And that can be hard every day. We try to make it a little bit easier so I can give you a simple solution for that. We've made it really simple for you. We deliver scripture to you each and every day at 6 a.m. Just go to our Facebook page. It's really short. I try to keep them short. It'll be quick and easy for you. Read the GPS along with us. Some of you just need to do that. Maybe read a little less news, a little less Facebook, and a little more scripture so you can have both. They help you to understand one another. 
I think some of us probably just need to reframe the way we see God. Is God that welcome friend that you're relieved to see when you're in trouble that's going to help you? Or is God the scary authority figure that's coming to judge you and condemn you and punish you? When you think of God and you think of your life, do you feel comforted because God is there to help? Or do you feel shame and guilt? Sometimes we just need to reframe the way we see God. If you have a child in Kids Way, I encourage you to ask them what they've been doing throughout Lent. Because they made that cross you probably saw last week on Easter that Emma held up with all those red hearts on it. And if you didn't know what those were, all throughout Lent, they took a red heart and they wrote something on it that they had to apologize for, something they had done wrong. And they took that apology and they nailed it. They stuck it to the cross. We didn't have nails, but we stuck it to the cross. Our kids, our kindergarten through fifth graders, took their guilt and shame and took it to God and left it there and left it there. How many of us do that? Or how many of us run away from God with our guilt and our shame? Sometimes we just need to reframe the way we see God. And some of us just need to be still. To be still and know that God is with us. To know that God is real. Most of us are working ourselves to death. We're running from work to extracurriculars to family events and back home to try to clean the house like that's ever going to happen. And then I got to get two hours of sleep and up the next day. And we're working ourselves and our family to death, running and running and running. And some of us just need to be still. It's really sad. I hear a lot of people who will say, um, man, you know, I just, I, and they feel so guilty when they tell me this because I'm the pastor, but they'll say, I just, I really wanted to come to church or this event, but I was just, I was just too busy and I just, I was so tired and I just couldn't do one more thing. I just had to, I just had to just camp out at home. I was just too exhausted, too overwhelmed. And I thought, that's fine, that's great, you know, take your time, you know, relax and, and, and rest, and I don't want to make anyone feel guilty, but I want you to know, this is the place that can help you with that. This is the refuge and strength. If you show up here, there's no prerequisites, just walk in, collapse in a chair with a donut, and if you look at the person next to you and you say, man, what a week, I'm just trying to get through, you know what they're going to say nine times out of ten? Me too. Me too. You're safe here. This is the place to find rest. And relaxation. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just letting you know this is the hospital. This is the rest. This is where we recharge. We can help with that. As I was watching that tornado on Friday, what I was hoping wasn't a tornado, I should say, the clouds in the distance, and, and I'm terrified about, oh, are we going to die? Is this the end? I was so stressed out. I'd been out there for like 45 minutes just like watching, right? Like, I know what the clouds mean. I took a one meteorology class in college, and now all of a sudden I think I know what the clouds mean. And I'm looking, and I'm watching, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I can't do anything about this. We have a plan if something happens, but why am I freaking out? And then I said, for, I'm preaching from a psalm on Sunday about finding peace and hope in the midst of fear, and here I am panicking out on my porch for something I can't do anything about. And it's already passed. I've got the radar. And I remembered this psalm. I've been to and officiated a lot of funerals in my life, and at every single one, we've read Psalm 23. Most of you know it. It's incredibly comforting. And so I stopped. I said, okay, put your money where your mouth is. Practice what you preach. And I started praying these words, and I said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And then immediately I heard the version that my high school football coach used to say, because I'm the baddest mother in the valley. And then I thought, wait, that's wrong. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work against the tornado. <laughs> what's the, I'm like standing there like, bring it on, tornado. You know, it's like, okay, wait, what's the God version? Okay. <laughs> because you're with me. I'll fear no evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I thought, this is ridiculous. So I went inside. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was doing the same thing. On Good Friday last week, we preached... The seven last words of Christ. We heard from seven of our church members about them. And I don't know if you caught it, but each one of those words, what Jesus is doing on the cross is he's praying the Psalms. They all come from the Psalms. He's praying those amazing words of comfort. And those words are there for you, and they're so comforting, and they're so helpful in those times of dark need and hopelessness. But you have to know them. You have to know what those prayers are, or they won't be there for you. We have to be able to know what those are. Be still and know that I am God. If you know God, really get to know God, you'll find hope and peace even in the most uncertain times. 
Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for being present with us. We give you thanks for building a community that we can call home. We give you thanks for these amazing psalms that bring us comfort, that remind us that we don't get to escape chaos just because we believe in you. You never promise that. But you do promise that no matter what happens, you'll be with us. No matter what happens, you know what that's like because you were there. You've lived through things worse than we can even imagine. And Lord, you proved last week as we celebrated Easter and your resurrection that the worst thing is never the last thing, that we have hope, that you give us that hope and peace. But God, it can be hard to see, especially in an election year. Everything is so hyped up. Everybody feels like the enemy. We don't know who to trust. And at times it can just feel hopeless because we're so busy anyway. We don't have time for all this. And then, God, sometimes we get that phone call and our heart drops. God, it seems like we're surrounded by stress and uncertainty and fear. And so in the middle of that, help us to find your peace. Help us to see you as our friend coming to pull us out of the gutter. Help us to see you as that refuge and strength that calms our hearts and reminds us that we are not bound to the uncertainty of these times. We have a foundation that stands the test of it all, that we can endure, that we can gather together with these people who are in the same place, worried about the same thing, stressed out about the same thing, and we can find safety and family and belonging so we don't have to do this alone. So God, help us when our strength and courage fails us, and when our words fail us, let us remember these beautiful psalms and let us remember the prayer that you taught us as we join together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.